is an MPY uh, direct injection opener. It's been uh, brought into the lab here right off the production line. And uh, this is the tool holder. Uh, up front here, this is the residue knife. Back here is the seed flipper foot shank. This is the hub. And of course right here is the direct injection shank that, that shoots the liquid materials directly in the slot and also the dry materials as you observe there at, at the Hooterite. This is a half inch thick blade and it's retained with 5 8 bolts uh, to the hub. The tool holder has set screws in it that allow you to set the angle of the uh, residue knife and the gap. And up here at the top, we have about a 3 8 to half inch gap. And at the bottom down here, this residue knife actually just kisses or touches the blade. And this causes the residue to flow around the residue knife and around the opener and allows the opener to go through tremendous amounts of residue. And yet, the seed stripper will lay the seed in on firm ground with no residue in the row. Well, uh, all of our engineering efforts really start with the hub, and for yielder owners that have uh, used the previous uh, machines, we have a spindle from a, a deep bander. This is off of a heavy-duty drill. You can get an idea how it's uh, machined. It's an inch and three-quarter in width in the back side here. It uses a castle nut up front to retain the additional Timken. This is the spindle that we use on the NP opener. Quite a difference in the size and the physical capacity of the bearings themselves. The bearings are about two times wider. It's a common pinion bearing. It's at a 45 degree angle. So it takes as much radial load as it does take thrust. Very important for the design of a, an opener is to have high thrust load ratings. And of course, uh, a lot of the drills that are in service today do not have Timken bearings, let alone the size of these larger Timkins that we use in the deep banding position. The uh, hub has blind bolts, so they're protected from rocks and, and chemical residue that damages the threads, and that's a comparison of the old hub versus the new. One of the keys in the design is the Caterpillar dual cone seal. And we use dual cone seals down inside these hubs and they keep the dirt out and the oil in. And uh, you can see this one's been in service and you can see there's a little corrosion around these lip edges here. But inside or internally there's no corrosion. And these seals are basically operating on a film of oil. So as you can see they actually turn against each other and run for extended periods of time without service. There's probably tractors out there that have run 25 years with these seals in them with no service. These are called toric rings and they take the vibration and the deflection of the shaft and keep those seals orientated to each other so that they rotate properly as the hub goes through the ground. Caterpillar must manufacture these in the hundreds of thousands. <clears throat> okay, let's uh, go take a look at a little cross-section view of the hub itself so you get a little better understanding of it. And then we'll come back and take a look at the opener in detail. We'll turn it around a little bit more so you can see the opposite side of the opener. This is the spindle that's welded into the stand. This is an inch and a half thick stand. Spindle two and a quarter inches in diameter. And if you notice, this is the dual cone seal retainer ring. And so this is where the toric ring presses in and it rides in this retainer ring. And you may notice that there's a couple of O-rings right here, one on the shaft and one on the back side of the stand. And they float, this whole retaining ring floats. So there's no load or force is transmitted into the spindle and the spindle can be full diameter right to the inside bearing. This is another important aspect of the design and how we prevent this from rotating is we have a dowel pin here that stops that dual cone retaining ring from rotating and yet allows it to flex and change um, with the uh, flexure of the spindle itself. 
Uh, this is the opposite side. Uh, this is the dual cone member that turns. This is the toric ring, and it's mounted to the hub, and of course it's rotating with the hub. These are the pinion bearings. They have a very narrow gap in here. We machine these very accurately so there's no step between these two bores. And of course these are set thermally so that these cups are positioned to run uh, for life uh, with a lot of shock loading. The hub cap actually screws on. And these are the uh, O-rings that protect the threads from fertilizer. So uh, we take no chances. We have an O-ring on the inside that keeps the oil from getting out. And then we put another O-ring right here that protects the threads from fertilizer and chemical damage over time. And of course, there's another O-ring and plug fill area right in here. And this is where we fill the hub. We actually vacuum test these hubs uh, as we assemble them. We hold a vacuum for about two minutes. This is the uh, thrust uh, washer right here, and this is a tongued thrust washer. You can see the slot that's been cut into the spindle, and this tongue thrust washer uh, prevents any uh, loads from going into the clamp nut itself so that there's no rotational um, drive on that clamp nut. This is the tongue washer that I'm talking about. There's a little tongue in the center of it. Mounts up flush against that bearing. And this is the clamp nut. We actually, it's, it's split in two here at the top, threaded through the center there. That's how we get this infinite positioning so we can set these bearings very accurately. Well, um, I think that about covers it. Uh, we use 20W50 uh, engine oil inside of these bearings so that they operate under cold climates. And if there's any condensate, it doesn't tend to damage the bearing where gear oil might. Let's go back and look at the opener here. We'll rotate it around a little bit so you get a better idea about what it looks like on both sides. This particular opener, we have um, set one of the slipper feet up to a tight so it won't rotate. And um, it's a little bit easier to handle this way. I'm going to scoot it out. OK. There's a back view. And you can see the two seed slipper feet. This is in direct injection shank here. Left and right slipper feet. Another rotation. Residue knife moves all the residue out of the way. Seed slipper comes along and lays the seed on a firm soil shelf. Really a unique design. We actually are able to deep band, put down two seed rows, and move residue, and do it with two Timken bearings. Very uncommon to find such a simple opener design. The real key is this blade. The blade runs in the ground about six inches and it's forced to turn. So the residue has to escape, and the only way it can escape is to go past the residue knife. Rotate it around again. Try to get it leveled up there a little bit for you. Real important to set these step screws, get every, all the clamps set right. Once you've done that, you'll run thousands of acres without having to reset it. There it is again, a little front view of the opener. You can see the residue knives and the angles. I'll tilt it back here a little bit. Of course, this is the non-hub side. You probably have a little bit better chance to look at the uh, direct injection shank because it's a little more ex exposed here. And we don't run that shank in the ground at all. We run it at the ground line. And that's real key in making this opener work is the shank runs right at the ground line. And we hold it very securely so it cannot move around. Uh, it has to be very stiff. And this blade cuts about a half inch to three quarter inch wide slot and lays the liquid and the dry materials into that slot. Now this particular shank does not have a dry tube on it, 
but of course you saw it there in the video at the hooter rights how the dry goes down.